Yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good whatever time it is, wherever you are. I am Anish DeVos. And apart from our very, I'm going to say phenomenal guest, we have the delicious David Buckler. And David, I'm glad I've shamed you slightly today. Thank you, as always. Absolutely, because I thought we would come back with a vengeance because we are two years without a community connections. We've yeah. been a bit busy and here we are. So, David, have you got anything that you just want to say to your fan club before? Because we've got to introduce the guest. Oh, uh, Hello and welcome, my unexpected fan club. Um, <laughs> They're still there, David. They've been asking when you, we're coming back. Not me. I think I just, they accept me to, you know. It's very much good you're coming. I assure you. Right. Okay. So enough of you, David. That's yeah. enough. You've had your yeah. time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I want to introduce somebody who I literally just think is bloody brilliant. And this is Professor Alec Grant. He has quite the history from a young guy in the RAF to a mental health nurse, a CBT therapist, to a reader at the University of Brighton, in more recent years to a professor at the University of Bolton. He is not only an autoethnographer, which we're going to talk about a bit later. He has a Lifetime Achievement Award for being an autoethnographer. He is a musician. He is a poet. He is an author. Couldn't find my words. Menopause. And he's a painter. And not only is he all of that. I mean, bloody hell, he's brilliant, isn't he? He is a pictitious Scott. <laughs> I'm going to give you one of those as well. Can you just tell us what a pictitious Scot is? Uh, I'm well, going to talk about autoethnography. Well, it's a, actually pictish Scot. It's oh, sorry. Uh, uh, when uh, the, the Picts were um, probably the, the indigenous peoples of the north of Scotland, mm -hmm. and, and when Ptolemy, uh, the Roman geographer, uh, described Scotland, he described Scotland's many tribes and uh, Pictland was was an area in the northeast of Scotland. Perhaps it came further down, and Picts were called Picts by the Romans because of Picti, or which meant painted people. Apparently, they used to run about naked and painted themselves in wood. Uh, not much has changed, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and they uh, were quite fearsome and scared the Romans, which is uh, and the English, which is great. Uh, um, and uh, so I come from that neck of the woods. Uh, my, my 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 clan, the Grants, have been there for a paternal from the paternal line, yeah. been there for since medieval times, perhaps before, or since the Norman Conquest, when the Normans came up the, to Scotland and invented the and 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 with 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 the name Grant Le Grand, and so mm -hmm. the clan Grant came into being, and the first chief of the clan was a Norman. Uh, that's one story. Another story is that we're derived from Scandinavians, from from Norse people. Hakun the Hakun the scary, or Hakun the great, or something like that. So yeah, so I'm a Pictish Scot. Pictish, not Pictitious. Well, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> we have a few other things thrown in, you know, along the way. <laughs> I'm going to keep claim, claiming it's my menopause brain. That's what I'm going to say. Don't worry. It's all right. No, no, it's okay. No probs. But actually, I make mistakes like that all the time, and David quite, well knows quite, I do. It's quite a nice, it's quite a nice portmanteau, pictitious. You know, I'm yeah. not really. I'm a fiction. Yeah. I'm a pictish fiction, or you know, something like that. You know? <laughs> exactly. uh, uh. Yes, we've kind of elevated your status. That's right. So. <laughs> I might disappear at any time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah of course. Yeah. It might be the connection as well. If I'm a bit more uh, prosaic about it. Yeah. But <clears throat> go on then. David and I are literally sat at your feet on this, aren't we, David? In yeah, terms yeah, of, as far as autoethnography. Ethnography, in terms of autoethnography. Yeah. Yeah. Alec, can you explain for everybody what autoethnography is? And right. actually, can you also explain it for some of the um, academics that don't necessarily understand what it is either? 
All right. Um, well, okay. For the academics, autoethnography grew out of the emotional turn and and sociology in the eighties, which uh, derived in, in turn from the the so called crisis of representation, where um, uh, ethnographers were distancing themselves from from their participants and not including their own voice. And uh, around uh, the, in the early nineteen nineties, Carlin Ellis and Flaherty. Uh, wrote a, a groundbreaking book investigating subjectivity and their thesis was that <laughs> the sociology of emotions should be emotional it should be expressed emotionally mm-hmm. and subjectivity was singularly lacking from social science research which was very into objectivism and positivism and so forth mm-hmm. so the need, you need to put the subjective in there you need to put the lived experiential voice in there mm-hmm. So um, I started doing autoethnography. Autoethnography is a fusion of uh, ethnography, the study of culture, yeah, uh, which comes from anthropology, um, uh, ethnographic inquiry, and but and autobiography. So the self written through culture, the culture written through self. Self flows through 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 culture. Culture culture flows through self. So the slogan goes: I came to autoethnography in the um, mid 90s when I was doing my PhD and I, I wanted to make a lived experiential first person high centered piece uh, much against the, the wishes of my supervisors in the University of Brighton where I did it and uh, and since then I've been I've been I've never stopped I've I've, um, I've written and curated edited quite a few books including we were talking about this before the session started, including uh, Aaron Carter's Badness, Aaron Carter's with Suicide, which are mixed ethnographies and straight mm. autobiography stuff. Um, the auto ethnography has to honor three components auto the self, so the self mm-hmm. self writing, yeah. subjectivist, eye, eye centered person, uh, lived experiential, uh, um, ethnos, addressing culture. Uh, as a critical autoethnography, autoethnography, I always address, I always <coughs> critique culture. I find culture always lacking, full of yeah. contradictions, full of holes. <clears throat> and uh, uh, graphy or analytic presentation, there has to be some sort of sense of anal- analysis. How do how do all the parts cohere? Um, <clears throat> And the problem with a lot of autoethnography, so-called autoethnography these days, which I made clear in my latest book, Plug Plug, writing. Very good book. I've read it. It's good, good. Autoethnography. <clears throat> uh, in chapter one is that you go, to, you go to conferences. Happens every time I go to a conference, either virtually or, 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 or really in the flesh, or you see things uh, even published. And and they're just little little stories. You know, that they're... they're um, you know, the, the, sometimes the, it looks as though they could have been written the night before. They're not proofread. They're full of cultural cliches. And they're often sob stories. You know, um, my boyfriend left me, the fucking bastard. Isn't it awful? You know, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, th- that sort of stuff leaves me cold. It's adolescent. It's, it's, <laughs> not, it's not scholarship. And I and I wrote this book partly because I wanted to introduce philosophical depth to um, to autoethnography because I've got a um, I've got a master's in philosophy too, um, so uh, yeah, and so I you know I've done quite a lot. Um, I've I've, I've I, I I write autoethnography across so-called mental health, but loads of other other areas too, including qualitative mm-hmm. research, training, uh, at university. Book. Uh, level mm-hmm. um, and I want m- m- most recently I want to help people be able to tackle autoethnography seriously not just imagine the right in autoethnography from knowing knowing absolutely bugger all about it and yeah. just writing a story about themselves um, which is usually culturally celebratory rather than culturally critical they don't they're not cr- critically reflexive enough to begin to look at, to ask themselves the question, what do I think about the way I think? And what do I think about the way I think about the cultures in which I'm embedded? So you often write in praise of, you know, mental health or 
their organisation or whatever. So I wrote this. Um, I wrote two things. One was crafting and recognising good enough photoethnographies, a checklist that's in mental health and social inclusion this year. Yeah. And it's on my research gate pages, by the way. And Which we will have down, we will put all of this in the, the bump underneath when, when yeah. this recording goes out, Alec. Yeah. <clears throat> the other one is is in praise of subjectivity. Yeah. I wanted to um <clears throat> provide some sort of depth with all of this stuff. Uh, to challenge, um, I don't know, philosophically light pseudo autoethnography. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Alec, t that lovely quote. Uh, obviously, I'm an autoethnographer. David, you're an autoethnographer, and <clears throat> um, <laughs> you know, in in my other life. Um, and Alec, when I started first talking to Alec, didn't know who he was, just started chatting to him on Twitter. And we, we began private messaging, we began emailing, and he shared his work with me. And I was like, oh my God, this is like a totally other, other level. And um, I think you said something like, there's the Bay City Rollers and there's Dylan. Um, mm. You're a raw talent, Anish, you're definitely Dylan, but you've got to put some work in this. And you said something yeah. to the effect of, about the Iron Levi's, I'll let you if you can remember. Oh it. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I, I stress this quite a lot. Um, <laughs> you, you, the, I, I, in the late sixties, <laughs> I used to when I was still in the Air Force, I used to go to Hyde Park concerts. You know, prog rock, mm -hmm. uh, Pink F Bloodwin Pig, uh, Stones, of course, and Led Zeppelin and all that. And there'd be all these weekend hippies. There, yeah, like the, the people were still wearing polar hats in those days and suits and umbrellas, <laughs> and these people, mostly quite well off, rich, uh, young, youngish men, maybe a bit older than me, maybe towards the thirties, but they, I was in my late teens at the time, but they, they, um, they had on all the gear, but the the gear was smart, like iron Levi's, you know, new Levi's, rather than scruffy old thing. And 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 I think um, pseudo auto autoethnographers are are, are often uh, analogous to weekend hippies, co-analogous to weekend hippies, and that they they dip into it and then they go yeah. back to being who they normally are, and they see autoethnography as just a method rather than they don't live it. There's a, a wonderful term um, that that my my friend and colleague Marcin Kaffer coin autoethnographicity autoethnographicity and that means you've got to live uh autoethnography you you've got to be permanently curious to your lived experience open to it yeah. thinking about what it means culturally thinking about what it means culturally critically so you've got to be constantly reflexive which is a bit of a tall order obviously it's an ideal mm. but you've got to try and live up to that as best as possible and i think a lot of people that write uh, uh, pseudo autoethnography um, or auto philosophically light autoethnography don't do that at all. They 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 just they carry on being firmly unreflexively in culture and just dip into it in order to, often in order to advance themselves if they're if they're um, academics up the greasy pool, the greasy neoliberal pool of. <laughs> New public management managed corporate university uh, academy. What you're you know. on about there, Alec? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, and I, I just want to see all these people fuck off. You know, come on. Um, you are literally a guy after my own heart. Literally, I'm always quite polite on these sessions. <laughs> I, I, I should I should have checked out before I whether I was allowed to swear because I swear a lot. I, I, do. I don't. I don't talk like I write, you know, I, um, I've, I'm bilingual, you know, acad academies and and, and uh, profane expletives, d delighted stuff, you know. Fantastic. Your breath yeah. of fresh air, especially on a very early morning call. Right. David, 
you as you are a, a phenomenal researcher as to say I'm a very badly behaved academic David you have had some questions that you wanted to ask of Alec hadn't you and Alec thank you so much for explaining autoethnography in, in that really colorful way because actually I think it's um <clears throat> I think it's something that really does need to be pushed forward a lot uh, more and yeah. given the respect and the vulnerability of, you know, that respect of the vulnerability of the autoethnographer. Yep. Um, and I think that's really important. So, do you know, honest to God, thank you so much for explaining it. David, over to you, my lovely. Well, thank you. I, that was fascinating, Alec. Um, uh, something that occurred to me a long time ago when I first decided, well, I didn't actually decide autoethnography found me rather than the other way around. And the more I read into it, the more I was fascinated by, mm. by how I could present a piece of work. I was training at the time I was at university and um, produced this piece of work. Um, and then when, at the same time, I had um, a private practice running as a psychotherapist alongside um, my second time at university. And I'm, um, I was surprised, I think, by the reception it got. Um, I was very apprehensive about submitting it as a piece of work to be assessed. But what came back stunned me in the fact that it was, um, it, it turned out to be quite praiseworthy um, and urged to publish it and followed by a statement such as, you know, get over yourself and publish it because publishing stuff when you've never done it, is is quite daunting. Um, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I thought, this is me in this piece of work of four or five thousand words. As a practitioner, I'm going to tell people about me. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to the practice, knowing my faults and all of my foibles? And it was it was a bit of a real expose. That's why <laughs> I thought it was a bit OTT, but done in the true spirit of ethnography as I saw it at the time in my naivety. And I just wondered what your thoughts were around that. You know, I've, I've it, it's the yeah. ultimate disclosure for a psychotherapist and disclosure is quite, yeah. um, it's I, quite an argued say, case. Alec, are you going to go to your coined phrase of <laughs> begins with N? What's that? Narrative entrapment. Are you going to go in there? Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. I'll, I'll, <laughs> Sorry, okay, I'll, 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 I'll mention that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, my thoughts on what you've just said, David. Um, uh, several, several thoughts. Uh, one is, um, uh, yeah. If you take narrative entrapment generally, that means I, I call it cultural narrative entrapment. Now I'm, I'm, I'm doing. I'm, I'm taking the work okay. further. No, it's okay. Um, uh, you, you wouldn't know that, Anisha. I'm just, I'm just started, but I, I think people are caught up in cultures and caught up in stories about culture and caught up in stories about themselves and cultures. And one story is that when you're presenting yourself as a psychotherapist in print, you should be talking about um, your, um, your, your, your clients and maybe an abstract, disguised, ethically disguised, and so forth. Um, uh, but you shouldn't be talking about yourself. Now I think that's that's awful, really, because I think that's a form of narrative cowardice, where you uh, want to. You, first of all, you. I see a lot of, and I, I saw this when I was a. I was a practicing cognitive behavioral therapist, but I was also the course leader for the masters in cognitive therapy mm. at the University of Brighton, and um, and. I saw this. I was interested in psychotherapy generally because my master's was in broader than CBT, my first master's. But you know, you get people present, and they still do it on Twitter. That they're, they're virtue signaling—that's the term all the time. They're yeah. presenting the squeaky clean, sickeningly, um, you know, often unbelievably <laughs> virtuous account of themselves in the background that are mm -hmm. kind of background presence that's virtue and i think that's rubbish i mean therapists i know when i was a therapist i didn't like all the people i was trying to help some of them i didn't like at all some of them and you, you see all these things but you know all my clients are lovely i'm i'm 
I'm, you know, chosen up now, but I don't know they're not. Some of them are bastards uh, and, and uh, just awful people. And, 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 and neither am I. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I am, there's a term, Caledonian anti zizigi anti zizigi means um, good and bad dueling in a single yeah. entity. <clears throat> I'm, I, I'm good and bad dueling in a single entity. Why should I present myself? Why should I not present myself? That's a big question. Yeah. Yeah. Why should I always write about others? It's a kind yeah. of benevolent, empathic yeah. violence because I'm colonizing yeah. them all the bloody time. Absolutely. And, and culturally appropriate and I'm culturally colonizing. And why should yes. I, if, if I do present myself, why should I present myself as Mr. Virtue? Because I'm not. Yeah. No. And you can, you can, you know, I, I know where the bodies are buried, right? I was, I was, um, you know, I got to know a lot of top top notch, or, you know, top of the tree mm-hmm. fellow of the um, British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapy people, and I, I said to one of them, he's, he's I'll not mention his name, but he's he's really big in psychotherapy. Um, uh, I said to him, look, you know, there's an, an awful lot of you know for a lot of courses, and I've taught on them. I was I was a, stu- a, a psychotherapy student myself. I didn't like a lot of my 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 fellow students. Um, so some of the humanistic ones, for example, would 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 walk over you if you were lying dying in the street. They didn't love, live live up to the theoretical hype, you know. Uh, f- and so, I said to this 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 person, look, you know, it seems to me that. Uh, from my experience, all you need for to get on a, a, a counselling uh, and psychotherapy course from diploma upwards is a pulse and the dosh to pay for it. Right? There's there's no there's an assumption of moral sufficiency, which is wrong, yeah. which is awful because <laughs> a lot of these people are morally really dubious, even the ones at the top of the tree. And this person said to me, "Yes, I agree." with you but that person would never say so publicly sure they would never say so publicly because it would undermine their fellow of the british association of counseling and psychotherapy status mm. so you know you got to call out bullshit yeah and i you know nothing terrible can happen to me now because i'm a, you know i'm 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 not i'm not a member of any I'm not in the BACP anymore, the BABCP anymore. I'm I'm not a practicing therapist. I'm not. But even before that, I started to to call that out, and I started to introduce the subject of voice of my clients and my cognitive behavioural therapy textbooks. Nobody else was doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, assessment and case formulation and cognitive behavioural therapy, 2010, I think, Sage book. I I introduced the, the, the you know I had little mini autoethnographettes from my, from my um from my clients nobody else was doing that the second edition that i wasn't involved in other people took over um they didn't do that either you know they, they reverted back to type you know yeah. keep us separate yeah and i think you know i just yeah yeah <laughs> there are so many things <laughs> <laughs> that I relate to what you just said. Yeah. So I would say to you, do not be and Anish, you, I would say, to you, do not be at all afraid of calling out contradictions. Yeah. Um and 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 presenting yourself yeah. in your in your work. Um you do that already, Anish. I know that. I'm I've, not particularly liked, you know, I don't always like myself when I write. I can look at myself and coin your phrase and think, God, you're a bastard, Anish. Yeah, and I, but, I've but, met people that have read my work and they've gone like, yeah. You're quite di-, and I'm like, well, because yeah. we all have different versions and I <laughs> use it to go boom. I set bombs well, on the right. When you write about yourself, warts and all, as the as as expression yeah. is, you, you're actually. You're actually doing an exemplar job for all those people who don't do that, and so they're going to they're going to dislike you because you're you're you're, you're, you're doing the very thing that that that, that they are. If you want to get psychotherapeutic Go about it, their shadow side, yeah, alive and kicking. The boys in the basement are are, are doing all that work, but they are not presenting that in prints. So they they're not going to like you. 
No. But would you want to be liked by these people? I wouldn't want to be liked by mm -hmm. people who didn't <clears throat> like me for, 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 for saying these things because I wouldn't think they were worthy of being liked from my end, you know, or respected. Yeah, I think it, it, it's it's a tough one, isn't it? Because you walk into the ethics and, you know, I hold my hands up. I can read me and think, you know, well, <laughs> that's not your best side there, Anish. But I I'm, I don't know. I'm quite I'm, I'm prepared to write it, if you get what I mean. Um, <clears throat> but it, it leads into the ethics, doesn't it? And, and David, we've had conversations and Alec, we've obviously had conversations about the ethics of this because, you know, <clears throat> how... It's, it's not just the ethics of the other people, because, of course, you know, as you alluded to earlier, when you're writing about clients, you might, you know, put them, anonymize them, etc. Um, but it's 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 so it's the ethics of the other people that you will be writing about, because you cannot write a story just about yourself because you That's don't right. live as a small entity with with no interaction with other people. But right. I also bring it back to the ethics of self as well. You know, yeah, self-care, yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm really hot on this about self care, about yeah, writing yeah, yeah. about yeah. yourself because <clears throat> I know you've now said it's culturally narrative entrapment as well, but it is that kind of, and that leads back to you, David. What you're saying, well, that's then me in there, and and what is my identity? I have multiple identities. You know, this is not a psychiatry thing. I have multiple identities. You know, I'm a mom. I'm a therapist. Yeah. I'm a trainer. <clears throat> I'm a co-producer with David of this. I am a woman. I have so many identities. I am right. somebody's family member. Right, right. So, right. Well, I think one of the things that gets missed out a lot is the ethics of self-care of one's integrity. Yeah. I need to nurture my integrity, and my integrity gets violated every time I don't say what uh, what the boys in the basement are, are, are urging me to say. Mm -hmm. I don't call out, you know, in the interest of advancing social justice and truth, etc. I think also talking about relational ethics, I, I want to mention Troubling Tolicism, that paper that myself and Susan Young wrote uh, back a couple of years ago, uh, which was, um, you know, redefining, relocating relational ethics so that you could uh, write those kind of th fearful things mm -hmm. and, and reasonably honour uh, relational, ethical uh, and um, respect. But it's not a black and white thing. You you mustn't yeah. write, but you know must you you mustn't be careful what you say, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's a, a paper worth reading. Uh, it's in the Journal of Autoethnography, and especially for um, you know pro-feminist, anti-misogynist, because uh, a lot of those you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that is <clears throat> is about closing down uh, female voices, mm -hmm. um, or women's voices. Um, Especially women or females. I don't. I don't know which is the right term to use these days. They're all a bit dodgy, aren't they? Uh, gendered uh, descriptors. But um, you know, especially women that have been abused. You know, the idea that you're not allowed to describe mm -hmm. or talk about your abuser without going to seek informed consent retrospectively or prospectively from them. And if you do that, do you mind if I write about the time you raped me? No. Don't do it. Fuck off. Yeah. Or I'll or I'll kill you. You know, something like that. That's stupid advice. So that's that that's the Tolicus line that you should do that. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I've I've gone off piste a bit, but no, no, not so. I, I I think I think mm -hmm. respecting one's integrity. And uh, you know, when when I write squeaky clean stories about psychotherapy and the the the, the you know the absent voice of the psychotherapist that's pronounced on every, and everything under the sun, under clients. I just find it boring. Mm. Mm. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, you know, oh God, here we go, here we go again. Yeah. Yeah. More of the same. Yeah. And and yeah. and um you know yeah. And just the whole idea of counseling and psychotherapy is is interesting yeah. culturally. Yeah. Uh, and and um so you, you don't want to get too comfortable with that even, you know. Um, yeah, I, I think when you become comfortable, then it, you should quit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's always a part of you. Or, well, I I like to think there's a big part of me in a session, per se. Mm. Uh, that's the conclusion I came to after the question that I put to you, is that yeah, if I'm going to help, then you're going to have to see me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
and and see me honestly, yeah. <laughs> or yeah. as honestly as I possibly can. You can't be yeah. totally honest, yeah. you know, because um, yeah. uh, you don't know yourself sufficient. Nobody does, um, but yeah. Yeah. a lot be... of it comes out in a session. <laughs> well, well, yeah, well, I indeed. didn't know that about me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, yeah. So if we. Yeah. Uh, as we always say this don't we David and I'm going to say it again we could talk for hours we really really could yeah, but yeah. <clears throat> so we'd like to you know bring this to a close and Alec, I want to say thank you for you for you, you've come into this exactly as you came in when we had lunch the other week you know <laughs> you are just you you are real and I really respect that in you you know <clears throat> we don't have to agree on everything <clears throat> that we sure. talk about but we have that mutual respect Right. And and I just want to say <coughs> so much for for just bringing this version of Alec. <laughs> I enjoy you're <laughs> naughty, you're intelligent, you're you know uh, vulnerable. You think a lot. I know these things don't just come out the back of your head. Um, you, you I'm really blessed that you're a mentor of mine and that yeah. you teach me a lot. But actually, I think recently you said to me, "I'm your friend." And, and that's a different thing to when I'm your mentor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and I just thank you for just bringing who you are today and hopefully kind of opening people's eyes up to, you know, what autoethnography is and actually how yeah. how we should challenge culture and yeah. how we should shine it so it all looks wonderful and we look great in it. Yeah, yeah. It's a risk, but I think it's a worthy risk. Yeah. David... I'm going to let you close as we always do because I talk enough. Well, as you, you just said, everything, and it, I, I want this to go on for a long time. I've been <laughs> fascinated, and I hope everyone that joins us is equally as fascinated. I'm going to do more. I'm going to pick up on more of your writing, Alex. Oh, thanks, um, too. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I will indeed. Um, I need to know more, um, and I hope you've given that. That mess. I well, I'm sure you've given that message too. Um, I guess the bottom line is you need to know more about yourself and be honest with it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So yeah. I'll, I'll sign off and say goodbye to everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, well, thank you both very much, Anish and David. It's been, it's been. I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've loved it, and uh, everything. I, I don't want anything cut out. It's all perfectly fine. <laughs> but you can. <laughs> I'm pleased yeah, to know from that. him. I'll <laughs> confirm that later uh, in writing too, if you want me to. But otherwise, it's it's perfect, lovely, wonderful. Thank you again. Brilliant. All right. Thank you. Bye, well, everyone. Best of both Bye. of you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye now.